Australia is one of the world's biggest coal exporters, second only to Indonesia. The amount mined from the Hunter region in New South Wales has almost tripled in the last few decades, and it's likely to double in the next. This is just one of 34 mines throughout the Hunter region that funnel more than 200 million tonnes of coal through Newcastle every year. Giant caterpillars of black coal are overwhelming residents. When we first came here, you might get one coal train a day. Now you get them non-stop. People are concerned that air pollution from the coal industry is a deadly threat to public health. Particle pollution is killing more Australians than motor vehicle accidents. And yet the government and regulatory response to that problem just has been so slow in coming. Although fine particles are too small to be visible to the naked eye, their size does matter. The smaller the particles, the further they get into your body. Those go into your lungs and can get trapped there and actually, under certain circumstances, can get into the bloodstream and affect some people's health. That can cause respiratory problems, heart disease, even cancer. An average human hair, about 70 microns wide, dwarfs fine particles. They're grouped by size into PM10, or particulate matter, up to 10 microns, PM2.5, about the size of bacteria, and PM1, one micron or less. Depending on what they're made of, fine particles can deliver toxic chemicals deep into the body. There's no level of exposure that's completely safe. A little bit of air pollution does a little bit of damage and more does more damage. For the larger particles, there's a national air quality standard to protect public health. But for the smaller particles that are potentially more dangerous to our health, there's no standards at all. Well, PM2.5 is an advisory level and... Uh, what does that mean? Well, that's a very interesting question. What our view, the EPA view, is that that advisory level should become the standard. As chairman of the New South Wales Environment Protection Authority, Barry Buffier is responsible for maintaining air quality. So one of the particulates of real concern to us is PM2.5, which are the very small invisible particles that you can't see, but have most impact on health. In the Hunter, we've got five monitors for 600,000 people. The whole of Sydney has five monitors. The national safety standard for PM10 is that average daily concentrations in a cubic metre of air should remain below 50 micrograms. For PM2.5, the daily limit is 25 micrograms, but it's not yet recognised as a national standard. PM1 is not monitored at all. Is there an intention to put some legal limits on these levels of pollution? Well, that's not the way it operates uh, nationally, so um, uh, I think the short answer to that is no. In the Upper Hunter, the vast majority of fine particles in the air come from mining coal, and burning it in power stations. Over the last decade, PM2.5 emissions have more than doubled. With mines almost surrounding her dairy farm, Dai Ji feels her family's health is under siege. We've got the five kids, and our three youngest are the ones that have the asthma. Courtney is the worst. Uh, she was born in 97, and that's when we think the mining boom started. We don't have asthma in our family. None of my family have asthma and neither do, does anything on Paul's side. Court, have you done a spirometry yet? Every day for the past three years, Di has been tracking Courtney's lung function. What was your readings, Court? 370. I like it whenever we go on holidays because I hardly get Seek and I hardly need to use my puffer. Like, I've been hoping to grow out of it by now, but I haven't. Yeah, and, and we've almost lost her twice this year. Her breathing has gone that bad. Oh, yeah, don't like it. The local GP in nearby Singleton used to treat Courtney, but she's not the only case. 
I noticed a few times when the dust monitor read quite high polluted. A couple of days later, you tend to see more people with kids with asthma come in. So you think there's a correlation there? I think there's some correlation there. There are so many asthma cases, he started his own research program with volunteers. My theory is uh, if he has some uh, high pollution, then their lung function test will deteriorate with time. Testing 680 children in the Upper Hunter, he found the rate of decreased lung function here was three times higher than the national average. So I think someone better step up to the plate and take a bit more responsibility for the health of our kids because some of them are going to be lucky to last at least 30 years old at the rate they're going. At the other end of the coal chain is Newcastle, where a hundred trains thunder between the mines and the port every day. Right now, Newcastle is the biggest coal port in the world. And if a fourth coal terminal is built, the port would double its capacity. We'd have an extra 100 coal trains every day. This one's got probably 90 or 100 uh, wagons to it, 100 tonne wagons. So they're not, they're not small trains. The Coal Terminal Action Group believes current particle levels are too high. So they're doing their own research. We're living with this legacy of pollution in Newcastle. Now's no time to double that pollution. Now's the time to sort it out. This is one of the EPA's three monitors in Newcastle that measure PM10 and PM2.5 levels at a school several hundred metres from the rail line. We're setting up our two sets of Osiris equipment here right on top of the EPA's monitoring station so that we know that the numbers that we're recording for PM10 and PM2.5 are identical or as close as possible to the EPA's. The EPA machine measures the concentrations of particles from their mass to check compliance with the national standard. In contrast, the Osiris machine uses a different method that detects airborne particles as they float through a laser. Once calibrated, the citizen scientists put their portable monitors next to railway tracks because they want to focus on the trains and measure particle sizes that the EPA monitors don't. It has the advantage of being able to give us four different particle uh, fractions concurrently. Simultaneously, we're getting PM1, the smallest uh, particles, PM2.5, PM10 and TSP, total suspended particulates. Their machine takes readings automatically every second, along with temperature, humidity, wind speed and direction. What we're aiming to get is a signature of a coal train so we can say with some confidence exactly what happens in this air environment as coal trains go by. This is an industrial city with fine particles coming from many different sources. How much comes from the coal trains themselves is in dispute. You know, we need to keep things in perspective. For the lower hunter, coal is not likely to be a significant contributor to PM 2.5. Up to 2009, 12 years of sampling at one Newcastle site found more than a third of PM 2.5 particles are wood smoke and sea salt, a quarter from cars and trucks, and another quarter from power stations and smelters. The remaining 14% that could account for coal dust comes from soil and industrial sources. So the maximum contribution that coal could be making to particulate matter is 14% if it made up all of that. We've got a coal train going by right now. While this is passing, it's an empty coal train. It'll have about 100 carriages to it. We expect that the particle pollution levels here will go, the PM10 levels, will rise from about 7 or 8 micrograms per cubic metre all the way up to maybe 100, 120 micrograms per cubic metre. While the monitor can't tell them if the particles are coal dust, it does measure whether they're in the very small size ranges that are risky for health. We've been seeing plumes of PM2.5 and of PM10 coming off the trains as they go past and the prevailing wind today is carrying those down in the direction of the childcare centres. So I think those kids are being exposed. Yeah, I think if we're building the childcare centre again, it should be another kilometre away from the railway line. The community research is advised by medical doctors, epidemiologists 
and air pollution experts. To be honest with you, my personal opinion is that I'm more worried about the diesel emissions because it's a burning process. And the diesel process then provides, uh, produces fine particles and, and nitrogen oxides, which both overseas have been determined to be an important health hazard. The diesel exhaust is mixed in with whatever's coming off the wagons. More than 30,000 people live within 500 metres of the rail corridor that brings coal into the port of Newcastle. That's 20% of Newcastle's population with coal trains rolling through their neighbourhoods. With no curfew, the noise alone is relentless. But for people with existing heart or lung disease, bad dust days can literally take their breath away. I suffer from heart failure and I've got a lot of fluid in my lungs. I can't disperse it. I'm on tablets for it. Now, on bad days, some days I've got to go on oxygen of an afternoon if I lie down and have a rest. I've got to put the machine on. When the oxygen machine was installed, we were told that because of where we live, adjacent to the coal line, adjacent to the coal loader, that we had to clean it every week instead of three k's away in a cleaner suburb, we'd only have to do it once a month. Look at that delicious cake. <laughs> wow. Ooh, coal dust pie. Parents raising young families in the rail corridor worry about the health of their kids. I mean, they cough at night from time to time, but it's a bit hard to know. We've only sort of ever lived here, so I don't know if that's normal for children or if it's just living here. The dust that's been found, those particles, are they actually coal dust? Are they something else? That really hasn't been looked into. So I think the community looks at, you know, dust on their windowsill or on their mantelpiece and says, that's coming from a coal train. It probably is. Uh, we haven't you know, looked at that specifically. The EPA is setting up a new research project in Newcastle to pinpoint the sources of PM2.5. Analyzing their chemical composition is key to understanding their impact on health. The best kind of health study is the kind that integrates both human health data and toxicological exposure data and information from studies done elsewhere overseas where they've been really looking at this. In the meantime, community groups believe there are actions that should be taken now. Just simply cover the coal trains. You can see that the, the stockpiles are, are piled up above the, the line of the carriage. Um, that needs to stop. The dust comes off the top. It's very simple. Just cover them. Dust levels depend on the type of coal and how dry it is. Coal stockpiles are watered to keep dust down. Wind tunnel research simulates a wagon carrying coal at 72 kilometres an hour for eight hours. It finds that spraying coal loads with a polymer sealant is effective at stopping dust. But trains are dusty even when they're empty. The carriages that are used here are bottom opening carriages and so that through time doesn't actually seal properly. So it acts like a sieve and actually drops coal the whole way along the corridor. The community monitoring runs into the night when the background levels of PM2.5 are lower. And then we're seeing those lift dramatically up to 20, 25 micrograms per cubic metre. That contrast between the background and the, the train signature is exactly what we're looking for. And here's the first look at what they found. A coal train has a particle signature with high initial spikes in PM10, PM2.5 and PM1. Levels remain higher than the background as the train passes. By comparison, this is the typical pattern of particles from a passenger train. These are early results that need more analysis and the debate continues. You don't discount anything that the community does or the input that they can provide. Come back and interview me in three years time, I might say, yeah, all of our focus is on PM1. 
The hope is we act in time to make sure that public health is not a casualty of the coal rush.